Now that 2015 is over, will 2016 be the year you can make some money in the stock market? Uh, maybe? From American Public Media, this is Marketplace. In San Francisco, I'm Molly Wood, filling in for Kai Rizdahl. It is January 1st, 2016, everyone. I am delighted you could join us. Now, it may be a new year, but it is still Friday, and that means the weekly wrap. Neela Richardson, chief economist at Redfin, and Cardiff Garcia with the blog FT Alphaville are here with me today. Hello, and happy new year to both of you. Hey, Molly. Hi, Molly. Happy new year. So let's start with maybe some hopeful thoughts for the new year, because 2015, in terms of the market and investing, was considered the worst year since 2008. 70% of investors lost money. Neela, is this going to be the new normal? I don't think so, Molly. I think innovation comes in cycles, and that's how people make money. When companies innovate either by bringing technology to the masses or to pockets or segments of the market, we didn't see much of that in 2015. The investors you referenced, though, are not necessarily retail investors. There weren't a lot of those either in 2015. It was mostly professional investors, people who were trying to fish out those pockets of the economy where money could still be made. Cardiff, what do you think? Is this uh, sort of a temporary lull or is it going to continue to be difficult? No, I agree. I think it's temporary. And I think to some extent this was expected. So keep in mind that uh, in the years prior to 2015, uh, monetary policy was loosened precisely to pull forward in time better gains in the stock market and in other asset markets uh, in the hopes that eventually the real economy would be spurred along to catch up. Well, look what happened in 2015. Even though the stock market had a bad year, the economy hummed along pretty well. Jobs growth was pretty strong. And And so I think what you're seeing here uh, is the two things converging. But so long as the economy is growing, and as Neil said, if we get a little bit of an innovative burst, then I think the stock market will uh, continue climbing again. Well, less volatility is what we saw toward the end of the year. That seems like a plus too, right? Uh, You know, volatility in and of itself is not so bad. I mean, that's how traders make money. Um, I think what we've had for so long was this false floor caused by a a Fed subsidy in the market with uh, near zero interest rates. Now that's gone. Um, And whatever happens in 2016, we know at least that it should be market-based and not based on monetary policy. And I guess that in itself is kind of an innovation right now. Yeah, I would add that we should also remember that the rest of the world uh, didn't have such a great year, and American companies aren't totally immune from slowdowns elsewhere, notably in places like China, stagnation in Europe, that kind of thing. So, I mean, these things come in cycles, but so long as the U.S. economy keeps going um, and if the rest of the world starts to recover, then I think, yeah, then, then, you know, stocks will be fine over time. So we saw some of the great performers last year were Netflix and Amazon, both of which almost doubled. Facebook did well. Tech stocks seem to be picking up. Does that bode well for something like an Uber IPO in 2016, Neela? Well, there's two ways that companies are making money right now. One, they're growing bigger like Amazon, or two, they're innovating like Netflix. Uber's kind of in the middle. It's trying to grow bigger, but it's being hamped in and hemmed in by regulation, sometimes fierce and aggressive regulation at the city mm-hmm. level. Um, and it's trying to innovate, but there is, again, this question about what is an Uber worker? Are they a self-employed individual contractor? Um, some regulators are starting to say yes, and some are starting to say no. And so Uber is fighting on two fronts. They're fighting um, metro-level regulation, and they're also trying to figure out their business plan, exactly who are these drivers and what are their relationship to the company. Well, yeah. and the on, So if this on-demand economy is the big story, it's certainly in, in tech, if you will, in 2016, Cardiff, how important is that regulation concern and, uh, frankly, the sustainability of any business model that depends on on-demand? Well, it is important, and it's sort of sensible that we're having a conversation now about how to think about people who work for these companies, how to make sure that we're taxing these companies in the right way. But let's keep in mind also that these are early years yet. I mean, people like these products. They want to keep using them. Uh, And I think over time, the experience of using them is also going to become more and more customized because they'll learn more about what it is that we want. And so my sense of it is that the regulatory bit absolutely matters, but 
But in the longer run, uh, I think it's all just going to be swamped by the fact that consumers want these products. So I, yeah, I, I think these companies uh, in in aggregate will be just fine. I mean, any one individual company can have a stumble, but um, you know, the industry itself, I think, will continue to grow. I have to say, I saw this week that Instacart was stumbling maybe a little bit, slowing down some hiring and raising prices, and I don't want to see that. I will ride Instacart <laughs> to the end. Right. Well, well, there are some companies that will stumble. I, I couldn't agree more about this being the early years of what we are calling the gig economy. Um, I, I would like to, to note that just because you, you slap an app on it and put a sticker in the back of the window doesn't necessarily mean you've changed anything fundamentally about the labor market mm. or the people who were in this economy all along. Um, what you what has done is that the workers that used to be individual contractors and giving people rides and being part of this delivery service now are being um, organized into a company. And that means that some of the profits they made doing small-time gigs is is now being taken by by these bigger companies, these tech companies. And so there's still a lot of fallout and shakeout for how this will develop over time. That's Neela Richardson from Redfin and Cardiff Garcia with the blog FT Alphaville. Thanks, guys, and Happy New Year. Thanks, Molly. Thank you, Molly. Happy New Year. Markets are closed today, but we'll have a look at some of the big movers of the year when we do the numbers. Now a look at the commodities markets. One way to measure how well commodities are doing is the Baltic Dry Index. It's a daily tab of how much it costs to move raw materials by sea. Not containers, just bulk things like iron ore, steel, and coal. Now the index, like most things related to commodities, ended this year down pretty dramatically. But the Baltic Dry Index can also be used to predict how the coming year might look. Marketplace's Andy Euler explains. It's a pretty simple supply and demand equation. I'll let Paul Bingham explain. He's vice president of the Economic Development Research Group. Um, It is a composite of the actual uh, ship charter contract to carry a cargo from one port to another in the world across a variety of vessel sizes carrying these these dry bulk commodities. So if there's nobody else shipping iron ore today and you got a bunch of it you need to get from Brazil to China, it's not going to cost as much. You've got too much capacity chasing too little cargo the dry bulk vessel fleet is too big for the demand that's out there in terms of global trade in those commodities. Basil Karatsas is a shipping consultant in New York. He pays attention to the index and says these numbers are awful news for shipping companies, but they're good news for mining companies. Of course, you know, you're getting killed on the commodity side of the business, but at least you're saving something on the, uh, on, on the shipping expense. When the getting's good and commodities are flying off the shelf, shipbuilders make ships, or at least they start to. Jean-Paul Rodrigue is the author of The Geography of Transport Systems. And the problem is, ships take a few years to be built, and when they enter the market, suddenly they enter the market where the conditions could be different. And that's currently what we are seeing right now. They call it a forward-looking indicator because what's on a ship today will be part of other economic activity later like manufacturing or retail. So if demand for raw goods increases, this index will rise. That's what shipping companies are hoping for in 2016. I'm A.D. Euler for Marketplace. If you're a fan of solar energy, I have good news and bad news for you. Good news first. Congress last month extended a tax credit that could double, even triple, American solar energy over the next five years. Now the bad news. For homeowners with panels on their roofs, it's not the federal stuff that matters. It's what happens at the state level. And in Nevada, new rates and charges effective today mean a big loss for solar companies and their customers and a win for the big electric utility in that state. From the Marketplace Sustainability Desk, Scott Tong reports. In many states, rooftop solar panels actually reduce total energy bills for homeowners. Perhaps not anymore, though, in sunny Nevada. Shale Khan at the energy firm GTM Research watches solar fights around the country pitting homeowners against utilities. And there are many. This one is definitely the most unfavorable toward solar that has happened. Solar customers served by Nevada Power face two big changes. First, the fixed part of their bill that they have to pay even if they barely use the grid jumps by 40%. And by 2020, it'll triple. 
however much solar power you want to put on your rooftop, you're still going to have to pay that fixed service fee. So the higher that fee is, the less you're able to reduce your bill with solar. And when consumers sell their solar energy back to the grid, the money they make will shrink 75% in four years. So here's the upshot. If you bought panels in Las Vegas figuring, say, a seven-year payback, you may never pay it back. And if you leased solar energy, assuming a low utility bill for a long time, nope. And these changes can happen anywhere, says energy economist Catherine Wolfram at UC Berkeley. If nothing else, this should make consumers wary about getting into these long-term contracts. Wolfram says utilities everywhere will try to jack up these minimum charges. Often, she says they're too low and actually don't cover the full costs of running the grid. In some ways, the rate structures have been kind of wrong. So I predict that there will be more pressure like this to get the rate structure to reflect the cost. For now, Nevada solar customers are facing the rate hikes. And the country's biggest solar company, Solar City, has already pulled out of the state. I'm Scott Tong for Marketplace. Twenty-five years ago, three guys from Egypt opened a hot dog cart in New York City. Muslim cab drivers asked them to start offering halal items. That's food permitted under Islamic rules. Observant cabbies need fast food, too. But it turned out everyone loved what halal guys were selling. The food cart became a New York landmark with lines around the corner. I, for one, will happily attest to its deliciousness. And now they're franchising, opening spots in Houston, Southern California, Chicago, and Manila. Dan Weissman has the story. Even on a cold, rainy December afternoon, New Yorkers, tourists, cops, and suits line up at the Halal Guys carts. Two, one on each side of 6th Avenue and 53rd Street. Santi Diansari is from Indonesia, where she works for IBM. She eats here every time she visits New York. This time, her family's with her. They're already asking to eat this. So later tonight, I'll come back. I tell her Halal Guys is planning a franchise in Indonesia. Really? Really? When? Not sure. Taking a halal food business national or global presents special supply chain challenges. For instance, with halal meat, you have to show the animals involved were treated with respect, raised without crowding, fed well, slaughtered mercifully while saying God's name. Ahmed Rahab runs the Chicago Council on American Islamic Relations. The main idea of halal is that it's done in line with the values that were given to us by the Prophet Muhammad that reflect the divine vision for humanity. So, mercy, kindness, um, efficiency, good use. For Muslims, halal food reflects those spiritual values. For most New York street eaters, halal is a brand that means generous portions of tasty food. Alan Sitzma edits New York Magazine's food blog, Grub Street, Back on 53rd, he takes the cover off a big, round foil container. Here you go. It's a full spread. Glorious plate of food. Chopped up chicken and beef hot from the griddle, smothered in a creamy, tangy white sauce and a generous splash of hot red sauce. A couple slivers of pita on top. Underneath? The neon orange rice, a staple of the Hoal Guys experience. And then lettuce on the side that kind of cools it down. And it makes you feel like you're kind of eating a vegetable for lunch instead of a big plate of meat and rice. Alan looks on as one Midwesterner, okay, me, takes his first bite. Mmm. Mmm. That's nice. Mm. Oh, and there's the spice. Woo! Oh, it's good. I'm all tingly. Ah. Thanks to an army of Halal Guys imitators, plates like this now seem to be the city's most common street food, with Halal Guys copycats everywhere. Even here, right by the original. I mean, you can look across. There's one right there. There's another one right there. But this is the one that started it. And it's the one with the line. And in New York, a line is good advertising. One of the first rules of living in New York and being a food lover in New York is if you see people waiting in a very long line for food, you get in that line. Because whatever they're waiting for is going to be good. New Yorkers are pressed for time. They are impatient. If they are willing to wait in line for something, you want to give it a shot. And that, we are crushing it in New York is a key rationale for the company's expansion plan. Hajam Hagazi is leading that plan. As uh, Sinatra say, if you make it in New York, you make it everywhere. He joined the business in 2010 to help with operations, and the questions he got from customers got him thinking. When you guys will open in our state? When you guys will be open in Paris? When you guys will be open in London? 
To date, he says franchisees have signed up to open 250 locations. How well will the food hold up? I asked Zach Brooks. He's founder of a blog called Midtown Lunch and Halal Guy's super fan, and he moved to Los Angeles a few years ago. So when a franchise opened in Costa Mesa, he drove an hour to get there, then waited in line 45 minutes. And? They have perfectly recreated it. The rice was the thing I was most worried about, and they nailed it. So today at Costa Mesa, tomorrow the world. In Midtown Manhattan, I'm Dan Weissman for Marketplace. Coming up. It's like, oh, your father makes marshmallow fluff. And then, you know, next thing you know, a teacher's announcing it to the class. And they're like just rolling their eyes like, oh, God, get me out of this. The family behind the fluff. But first, let's do the numbers. Markets were closed today, although I don't know why they needed a rest. They mainly stood still in 2015. The S&P 500, the broadest index, slipped seven-tenths of a percent after zooming up 11 percent in 2014. Tech stocks were the big gainers, led by Netflix, up 140 percent. Amazon up 118 percent. And Alphabet, which was founded as Google 17 long years ago, was up 43 percent. Apple had its first negative close since 2008, down 7 percent on the year. And you are listening to Marketplace. You're listening to Marketplace. I'm Molly Wood. Now, despite the popularity of Halal Guys, which we told you about a few minutes ago, big plates of meat with creamy sauce are probably less of a food trend than they used to be. The food and beverage industry is finding that we prefer to be sated by more healthy, natural food. And in the coming year, food makers and sellers will be trying to deliver. Marketplace's Annie Baxter has a look. Food trends develop slowly. So says Darren Seifer, the food and beverage industry analyst at the NPD Group, a research firm. Seifer says there aren't seismic shifts in the offing, but he expects a few trends probably will accelerate. Some of them boil down to one simple word. Just think of the word no. So no preservatives, no additives, no growth hormones. Seifer says all those no's are part of consumers' growing focus on clean food labels. They want food in its purest form. Seifer says consumers will keep that up in the coming year, along with their developing aversion to sugars. Whether you're talking high-fructose corn syrup or table sugar, Seifer says added sugars are replacing fats as the demons of the food world. So about two-thirds of adults are now telling us that they're trying to cut back on or, or avoid sugars completely in their diets. That means sweet foods will keep losing ground to savory ones. Processed foods will keep losing ground to fresh produce and meats. This is all playing out in the restaurant world, too. Industry consultant Michael Whiteman filled me in. Okay, you tell me if something is in or out. Vegetables. In. Uh, pasta. Out. How about fried chicken? In. If that last one, fried chicken, seems surprising, Whiteman says some restaurants are basically using it as a vehicle for hot sauce. It's a contest to see who can blister your palate more. Spicy foods in general, also a thing. Count on seeing more of it in the new year. I'm Annie Baxter for Marketplace. On the outskirts of Los Angeles, about a dozen mountain lions are roaming around. But they're basically trapped there. At least another dozen have died trying to cross L.A. freeway since 2002. The city has proposed a way to make it easier for the lions to expand their territory and not die out. That solution is a $50 million land bridge, which raises the obvious question, how much is L.A. willing to pay to save these animals? Adam Popescu reports. John Steinbeck once said, anything that just costs money is cheap. It's really a question of how do we feel about wild places and what we want to live near. Can you put a price tag on that? It's a relevant issue overlooking the 101 freeway in Agoura Hills, a Los Angeles suburb. So we're looking at 101, one of the busiest freeways in the world, and we know it's a major barrier to connectivity for all kinds of wildlife. I mean, it's an amazing thing, I think, that we still have mountain lions in Los Angeles. That's Seth Riley, a wildlife ecologist with the National Park Service. For the past 13 years, he's led a study of the lions in the Santa Monica Mountains, the 275-square-mile range running from the Pacific through downtown L.A. Freeways keep fresh blood from coming in, and younger lions can't establish new territory or find mates. And that leads to inbreeding and ultimately infertility and death for this population, unless there's a way out. Without increasing connectivity and basically building wildlife crossings like a tunnel or this overpass, without increasing wildlife connectivity, I think the mountain lions are definitely going to be lost. It'll just be a question of in how long. 
The crossing would create a direct path between neighboring mountains, a land bridge that other animals and even hikers can use. An animal crossing on this scale, over a 10-lane freeway, it's never been done before. It's a first. But California senators, even Caltrans, the state's transportation agency, they're all supportive. The one thing they haven't agreed on is just where that construction money will come from. And they're going to need quite a bit, upwards of $50 million. So it's certainly a lot, although in the context of what it costs to do transportation projects, it's actually not all that much. Um, so, I don't know, I think people are, care enough on, and are interested enough that, that it will happen, but, but we'll see. We have a, a goal of $10 million by 2017, and then the remainder by, uh, the, I think it's the summer of 2019, with shovel ready, ready to begin construction early 2020. That's Beth Pratt Bergstrom, the California director for the National Wildlife Federation. She's in charge of raising money and very optimistic that she can do it. So optimistic that she got a mountain lion tattooed on her left bicep. Her vision is to get federal and private dollars, like the tens of millions raised for the Everglades and the Great Lakes. I think we owe it to these mountain lions. I think we owe it to all wildlife. Uh, And I think also it's a great chance for Los Angeles, who, as we know, has long been tagged as the environmental villain in the world, uh, rightly or wrongly, to show really leadership around the world. There's still a long way to go. So far, Pratt Bergstrom has only raised $1.1 million. Federal grants take time to get. That's why she's hoping L.A.'s generous donors follow the example of Larry Ellison, who recently donated $50 million to build an animal sanctuary in Silicon Valley. The lions are under pressure. If even one male dies in the interim, the whole Santa Monica mountain population is in jeopardy. But if the bridge gets built in time, there's a good chance we will keep mountain lions in our backyard. In Los Angeles, I'm Adam Popescu for Marketplace. Okay, I hope you don't think that you're about to start your New Year's healthy eating resolution right this second because I am here to tempt you with marshmallow fluff. Even if we are eating healthier, some treats must endure, and a small factory in New England is doing its part to keep the fluff flowing for the next installment of The Holidays, brought to you by. We sent reporter Susan Kaplan to uncover the mysteries of marshmallow fluff. Marshmallow Fluff's Never Fail Fudge is a classic holiday favorite. This time of year, sticky fluff is scooped into cheesecakes and frostings. Even high-end caterers pour fluff into chocolate crusts for a s'more-like dessert. Still, even with a GPS, it's tricky to find the small, nondescript Durky Mower factory tucked on a side road in Lynn, Massachusetts. I definitely smell sugar. Mmm, smells pretty good. Okay, let's let's go in. Marshmallow Fluff's a one-family operation. John Durkee, an unassuming guy, grandson of H. Allen Durkee, runs the business today. And every jar of the sticky, sweet, snowy white goop is made right here, starting with cooked syrup that's put into 140-quart kettles with egg and flavoring. And it gets beat on our giant mixers. No pictures up here. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. (laughs) Got it. The no pictures thing is serious. The company's not interested in getting attention, and there are plenty of requests. The formula is a family secret, even though it's only four ingredients. Corn, sugar, egg, and vanillin, which is an artificial vanilla flavor. And that's it. John Durkee's the third generation to run the operation. He says he kind of knew when he was a kid that he'd take over one day, but he's not so sure about his children, who he says get plenty of attention because of the family biz. It's like, oh, your father makes marshmallow fluff. And then, you know, next thing you know, a teacher's announcing it to the class, and they're, like, just rolling their eyes like, oh, God, get me out of this. Durkee hopes one of his sons will step up, especially since he says business is going well. Though the Durkees are pretty tight-lipped about financial information, too. The return on equity on family companies that are going well is huge. It's like 40 or 50, 60 60 percent. It's a huge number. That's George Stalk, a senior fellow and founding member of Boston Consulting Group. And you can't get those kind of numbers in today's money markets. And the reason, Stalk says... They're cheap. (laughs) That's what it has to do with. I mean, family companies are incredibly cheap. This family business still pumps fluff into glass jars and plastic tubs on a conveyor belt that looks like it's from the 1960s. So it goes from here into that machine, which puts the the plastic seal on it. Durkee says much of the equipment is original. That makes upkeep challenging, 
But the demand keeps that conveyor belt going. Turkey says fluff is sold in Russia, Japan, Israel, and parts of Europe. On my way out, I asked John Durkee if he had a holiday favorite. No contest, he said. Put a spoonful of fluff in the bottom of a mug, pour in steaming hot cocoa, and watch the fluff float to the top. In Lynn, Massachusetts, I'm Susan Kaplan for Marketplace. This final note before we go, if it seems like you saw really, really, really a lot of ads for diamond jewelry over the holidays, it was not your imagination. The diamond industry is in a little trouble. And that might mean 2016 is a good time to go bargain hunting for shiny baubles. De Beers is the world's largest diamond mover. It was behind a huge holiday marketing campaign here in the U.S. and China trying to boost sluggish diamond demand. Rough diamond prices fell 18% in 2015, and the finished product, those polished stones, discounted 8% last year. And analysts say more price cuts are coming. So it's good news if you want to buy a diamond, but bad news if you want to sell one. The Rappaport Diamond Index says the price of top quality diamonds have dropped more like 80% over the last 30 years. At least they're still really pretty to look at. All right, start of the new year, end of the show. Markets were closed today, but they're back open on Monday. Our theme music was composed by BJ Lederman. Marketplace is produced by Satara Nieves. Deborah Clark is the vice president and executive producer. I am Molly Wood. Kai Rizdahl will be back on Monday, and you all have a great weekend. This is APM.